you please welcome Nick Groom. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Matthew, and uh, thanks uh, to the organisers for an opportunity to develop uh, some ideas, which I'm pleased to see are already emerging um, on the agenda with the very first question from the floor. The contemporary analysis of climate change should not be confined to bioscientists and meteorologists. It's also a cultural issue, and as such, it requires us to develop our understanding of heritage and conservation. Culture has its rightful place in museums and the media, galleries and theatres, libraries and the classroom, but it also needs to rediscover its place working and living in the fields and woods and rivers that sustain us. If we can accomplish this, literature, art and music, history, folklore and tradition can become ways of ensuring a fuller and crucially an active engagement with the world rather than a means of escaping from it. This is my call to arms. What we need to develop is a cultural environmentalism. It's in this context that I'd like to remind you of the European Research Council's priority research areas for the recent Heritage Plus call. The ERC being, of course, highly influential in setting the agenda for UK university research strategies. The first priority sums up the position. Managing material site and structural change in the context of different environments and global change. For me, from the perspective of higher education, this amounts to an invitation to rethink the whole sector of heritage in the context of the environmental crisis. My own current work argues that the landscape has increasingly been represented as a figurative space and less as a literal place. And in doing so, that's removed rural labor and culture from the perception of the countryside as an ideological justification for enclosure, privatization, and commercialization. And my work is an unabashed rallying cry for the life, culture, and identity of the countryside. Now, for a striking example of how the culture of the festive year conflicts with the current climate and how it's resolved by political, political economy, consider not the lilies of the field, but the daffodils of the Lake District, or rather Wordsworth's poem on daffodils first published in 1807, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. These verses have inspired tea towels, fridge magnets, T-shirts, even wrappers, not to mention horticulturalists everywhere. The Lake District National Park itself, a protected space created in part by Wordsworth's own campaigning, is traditionally where lovers of Wordsworth's poetry go to gaze upon golden daffodils in the springtime. In 2007, the flowers bloomed early due to late frosts. They were not expected to last until Easter, but so as not to disappoint visitors to Fulborough Park on the shores of Lake Windermere, a hundred silk and plastic daffodils were planted in their place. Now, the plastic daffodils haven't become a regular feature yet, but this isn't all. In 2012, the, the village of Burton on the Water, the Venice of the Cotswolds, voted among England's prettiest villages, replaced a patch of grass in the village along the River Windrush with astroturf. It is still there today, I checked. I called them on, um, on Thursday. Five years previously, the same village had also trialled silk flowers in hanging baskets. So is the English springtime of the future going to be one of plastic flowers, pre-recorded cuckoos and fake April showers? A virtual reality engineered by soft cultural cliches and driven by the market forces of tourism. Now, how did this idea of the idyllic countryside emerge? As suggested by quoting Wordsworth, it arose in part from poetry, literature and art and from the traditions of the pastoral and the picturesque. These cultural influences grew heavily on the intellectual enthusiasm for the ancient classical world that pervaded the Middle Ages and dominated the Renaissance. This meant that literary accounts of landscapes and farming were based on Roman environmental and agricultural descri descriptions recorded some 1,500 years earlier. Consequently, the country um, has been celebrated in ways that made it conform to the cultural standards of a different epoch and another country. Pastoral writing in English was for several centuries a gigantic exercise in imitation that eventually had deleterious effects on the land. Pastoral poets imitated the ancients, the landscape disappeared under a classical veneer, and these cultural expectations significantly affected subsequent attempts to make sense of rural life and the environment. So the landscape and the values and expectations we attach to it are the result of at least 500 years of cultural encoding. 
the arts were enlisted as an activist wing of political economy to imagine the nation in different, often more profitable ways. This, they helped to sentimentalize the land and rural communities, which is perhaps why there aren't many poems today about single farm payments, DEFRA, or castration rings. Um, although there are, in fact, a few, I draw your attention to the work of uh, Chris Chapman and James Crowden, for example. So this, then, is a context for rural heritage. The aim should not necessarily be to accept how the land and its people have been represented in the past, but to engage constructively with the needs and aspirations of these places and communities in order to reflect their local distinctiveness more effectively. We need to question the picture postcard assumptions of rural life by working with the writers, artists, and curators towards a more informed version of this life and the communities as they face new and challenging social formations, the internet, migration to the country, second home syndrome, as well as climate change. Ironically, traditional representations of the countryside have often worked as much to cut people off from the rural life and culture as they have done to preserve and cultivate it. Take the cuckoo a touchstone of rural culture, and the most written about and sung about in mythologized birds of Britain. What does a cuckoo sound like? Anybody? Yes, thank you, somebody knows. <laughs> well, imagine my surprise when a university lecturer confessed to me last year that she didn't know and couldn't recognize this seasonal bird song. Now, admittedly, she wasn't a bioscientist, but she'd been in an English literature department for 10 years and had taught romantic poetry, including Wordsworth's poem, The Cuckoo, during that period. She just accepted the name of the bird as a bringer of spring, and that was that. Well, these days, of course, many city dwellers are lucky to hear a cuckoo at all, but I think most of us would recognize its call. But what about the nightingale? Again, one of the most written about and mythologized birds of Western culture, known for its mellifluous song. I'm sure um, everyone in this room will have heard of John Keats's Ode to a Nightingale, but who could confidently recognize the bird's song? fewer. And yet when we read that poem, how many of us bother to go and find a recording of the bird? I'll venture it's none. Now the 19th century peasant poet John Clare was hugely amused when he visited London and saw a group of metropolitan types listening with rapt attention to what they thought was a nightingale, but which Clare knew was actually a blackbird. <laughs> D does this matter? What's the relationship between culture and nature here? Do we experience the song first and then read the poetry? Well, yes, perhaps if we're John Clare, we do. But I think that for most of us, there are a series of more complicated interactions in which we come across cultural and social references to nightingales far more frequently than we hear the bird's song itself. And when we finally do hear it, we may find that our cultural expectations are so high that we are somehow disappointed in the experience. Nature fails to live up to culture, and the bird is better off staying in a poem, perhaps, than roosting in the woods. So what we're now hearing is a recording of a nightingale. In fact, I was going to play you a blackbird to see if anybody notices. And that rumbling in the background um, is the sound of uh, Wellington and Mosquito which was recorded in 1940. Um, so we have here those complicated interactions of nature, culture, heritage, history, and politics all happening in a single recording. Now the point of all this is to restore our landscapes. Heritage and cultural conservation are not independent of the ecological issues. Rather, culture should be at the heart of environmental thinking. Moreover, moreover heritage and culture can alert us to the non-quantifiable elements of a place. What is left out when an acre of land is seen simply in terms of profit? What is missing when urban development is based on the arithmetic of providing affordable, as opposed to unaffordable, housing rather than homes? Aesthetic qualities are nigh on impossible to define, let alone quantify, but they are nevertheless deep influences on why many people visit, holiday, and indeed live in the country. The engagement with the natural world and green spaces stimulates well-being, restores a sense of identity and even spiritual connections in relation to the rhythms and seasons of the natural world. The aesthetics of the land can also alert us to the distinctiveness of certain locations and communities, and their particular traditions, customs, and heritages, situating us and educating us in the complexity and changeability and uniqueness of place. If market forces are driving heritage tourism, then we need to account literally for heritage, as we have increasingly been doing. The financial planning of the countryside amounts to quantifying its productivity, 
calculations that may involve crop yield or grazing capacity, possibilities for housing de development or the fracking potential of an acre of land. Uncomfortable as this perhaps is, we attempt to quantify culture and heritage to ensure that they are key considerations in these budgets. The alternative, however, is to focus on the intangible and immaterial. And this is forming the vanguard of current thinking in the humanities and social sciences and even integrative medicine, what has been called cultural ecosystem services. A national and international agenda needs to be developed to ensure that welfare, security, health, and social cohesion are recognized as forming a fundamental part, the most human part of any assessment of a site or location. We need to build and sustain resilient communities and develop support mechanisms that can reconnect these communities to their own individual heritage and also to wider national life. But even this isn't enough. In 2003, UNESCO declared its Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage to protect, and I quote, the practices, representations, expressions, memories, knowledge, and skills that communities, groups, and individuals construct, use, and transmit from generation to generation. In practical terms, intangible cultural heritage covers the often highly localized and distinctive customs and traditions that give meaning to everyday life in communities. And this often means those small rural communities that are often so easily overlooked by funding bodies. The challenge then is not to default to preserving material culture, but to conserve the immaterial. The ICH UNESCO Convention, as we've heard, has yet to be ratified by the UK, but it reveals that the key challenge we face as we look to the future is not only to decide what the world will look like for the next generation, but crucially, how it will be, how it will be lived in ways that sustain local communities and foster identity by cultivating diversity and distinctiveness. Thank you. Thank you.